my research is specifically around school policing right now. And so this layering zero tolerance with the presence of a school resource officer or a school liaison officer it really complicates the picture. Part of the struggle I have with this research is that we have, it feels like there's not been enough conceptual work done about what we mean when we talk about school safety. There seems to be a lot of knee-jerk reaction to, well, we're going to make students safer by putting in metal detectors, or we're going to do, so there's an unacknowledged underlying idea of what school safety means but we need to bubble that up, make it explicit, make it intentional, really discuss what we mean about yeah. school safety, whose safety, how do we define safety. No, no, no. No, no. In this busy Welcome world, to the know. Safety Doc Podcast with author, radio host, and, and nationally recognized safety expert, Dr. David Perodin. Join us each week as we discuss the best and most bizarre practices in safety preparation and crisis response. Follow Dr. Perodin on Twitter at SafetyPhD. And remember, the truth will keep you safe. Hi, everybody. This is Dr. David Proden, the Safety Doc, and welcome to the Safety Doc podcast. A thank you to John Grant and the 405 Media out of Los Angeles, California, for syndicating the Safety Doc show. With me today, Anne Marie Kotman, Texas State University, researching school safety specific to school policing, has a lot of information to share with us about zero tolerance. We've heard so much about zero tolerance, and it's not all it's cracked up to be, folks. So welcome, Anne-Marie. Hi, David. Glad to be here. Thank you. So, Anne, if you can tell us uh, about your background, and um, I believe you, you started as a, a teacher. Yes. Um, there was an epiphany, a defining moment that brought you into a doctoral research program. So if you can help us understand that. Sure. I got a master's in teaching in the 90s after not expecting to go into teaching when I got my undergraduate. But I had an opportunity to work in the schools on a voluntary basis and decided that, well, that's where I needed to be after all. So once I got my degree, I began teaching in the public schools. I've worked in private schools, alternative schools, in the homeschooling community. I've taught adults. I've taught retired mage folks. I've taught nursery school age folks. I just love the idea of pedagogy, andragogy, teaching. Um, through my own small business, providing teaching opportunities after school care, summer camps, private school tutoring, one of my clients is a professor in my program. And we'd had many conversations over a couple of years that her boys were students of mine. And she said, you know what? You need to do this. And I said, you're crazy because at my age, why would I? I hadn't even considered this. And she said, come to my house. We're going to have coffee. I'm going to talk to you about it. And now I am thrilled. I couldn't be happier. This is exactly what I need to be doing. And I'm definitely called to in investigating the intersection between schooling and policing. It's a really critical juncture that needs school leaders to step into this moment and investigate. Boy, absolutely. Um, and, and I shared today uh, in a discussion that we had uh, before the show that many people have been contacting me also to learn about zero tolerance and, and how that interfaces with school policy, and then also school policing. So give me your definition of what zero tolerance means. So zero tolerance discipline policies, as I understand them, and I think this is a general research consensus, is the idea that it approaches discipline policies with a procedural response that doesn't allow for any kind of discretion. So there's a definitive outcome for a determined violation, no exceptions made. And it started out, historically, it was a gun-free schools and drug-free school zones. But quickly, this idea of zero tolerance was adopted across discipline ideas, you know, even smaller infractions became enforced by a zero tolerance policy. 
And I, it's interesting because I think, you know, you can argue about how important intentions are, and I'll, I will argue about that at a later point, sure. perhaps. But even if we do place importance on intentions, the intentions were good, right? The intention was to make a safer school. The intention was even to make more equitable outcomes. The idea is if there is a standard and it's across, applied across the board, how could that be inequitable for different student populations? Unfortunately, the effect has not met out those intentions. Um, the APA did a big investigation of zero tolerance policies. They did a report, and I think it was 2006, that said they looked at zero tolerance and they said, while the intention was good to create safer school environments, what it has in effect, the net result is less safe school environments and more entrance into the school to prison pipeline, more devastating um, discipline outcomes for students and academic outcomes, dropout rates. So, and some of the uh, zero tolerance examples that we've probably all seen on TV, uh, you know, it could be a kindergarten student who makes a handgun gesture with a thumb and a, a forefinger. Sure. And that student then is suspended. Um, and sometimes a school board will move toward expulsion. Uh, it can be a student that has uh, aspirin in a coat pocket. And then, you know, that brings it into the school setting. And suddenly it's a drug in a school setting per policy. And the student again can be suspended, expelled. So sus suspensions, I'll, I'll define that out. Suspension, sure. um, you know, typically two to, to ten days is, is a window for a suspension, a student being out of school. Now, expulsion is taking that student before the school board and saying, you know, we're going to have a student out for anywhere up, up to a semester to permanently. Um, and if it's a student with a disability, there's some considerations on having to provide uh, an education, maybe an alternative setting. But we're talking that um, once this, this happens, um, that's the, imagine, I mean, I, I try to imagine, I have two daughters, if something like that happened to them um, and said, well, this, this was on the playground and they were doing whatever, and now your daughter is suspended and everybody else knows, and the other kids know, and, um, and I'm like, wow, this, where, where was the, the assessment of this is a kindergartner, how do we teach, right. what is expected behavior, what is an expected behavior, and this is something that I remember growing up was, you know, this was on cartoons and, and just, you know, regular um, TV shows. And suddenly it's moved, it's moved rapidly. Um, give me, and how did you come up with your um, idea for your research questions? And, and could you share what your research question is? Uh, well, my research question right now that I'm really diving into involves school policing and how we train school police officers. But with regard to zero tolerance, my question is knowing that zero tolerance has been identified in the research as a piece of the school to prison pipeline, how does that actually work? When yeah. we're putting that into place to promote school safety, how could it be promoting school safety if it's introducing kids to the school to prison pipeline? And then investigating that further, not only is that a devastating effect, and specifically for certain populations of students, and that in itself is problematic enough. But even from a larger measure of school safety, it's a problem. Here's what I mean, David. When you talk about when you talk about measures of school safety, we started you can't measure school safety if you're looking at people's conceptions are often like school shootings, right? School yes. stu, uh, school safety means we're not gonna have school shootings. Well, you know, my alma mater never had a school shooting, still hasn't had a school shooting. So how do you measure any change in safety at my, yes. high, at my old high school, right? So we started measuring instead students' perceptions of safety, that that was, and not just students, but all stakeholders, perceptions of safety and school climate in general, and that that would be a great way to measure an improvement in school safety. Well, here's one of the most devastating things for compromising students' sense of safety, and that's if they can't trust the rules. And we know that zero tolerance means students don't trust that the rules make any sense. <laughs> so by our very definition, the way we're measuring safety is students' perceptions of safety, and we are knowingly compromising that by these zero tolerance procedures. 
Students know that zero tolerance don't, doesn't make sense. And then we lose the opportunity to help students develop critical thinking skills. When we have zero tolerance, it, it privileges compliance over actual, like, critically thinking about what's important and what makes the school safe and what makes the school run and how can I be involved in this community positively, right? If it's all about compliance and it's always measured outside of the student, it's, you know, in other words, there's a top-down definition yes. of whether or not you have met the, the school needs, then we haven't invited students to develop those critical thinking skills that we know, I mean, in your book, that, that critical thinking that's key for students to be able to be safe. They have to have those critical thinking skills to be able to transfer skills, transfer knowledge, respond to strange environments, strange situations, and that includes emergency situations or potentially safety compromising situations. Zero tolerance works against what we know is best practice, and that's developing critical skills. I completely agree with you, Anne-Marie. And, um, I, I was a school administrator for a number of years, and I remember um, a, a robust discussion about discretion with the administrative team. And discretion it was and is the tool to allow principals to take policy and rules and bend those appropriately to fit the setting. And very explicitly, we had a brand new elementary school and we also had a 100-year-old elementary school, four stories. It still had fireplaces, these huge fireplaces. Um, they weren't used, but it, it, was, it was just <laughs> just to give an idea of, of how different these structures were. So, for example, if we looked at fire drills, what was our expectation for time to exit a building? Um, it, was, it was different in the four-story sure. building. Um, obviously, it made sense, right? But if you had one standard, if you had like kind of a zero-tolerance approach thing, our fire drill, everybody has to be out in 88 seconds, or something like that. Well, it's not going to happen in this building. No matter what, it's not going to happen. So there has to be discretion to what is appropriate for this building, for this specific building. And, of course, um, looking at, at discipline at elementary school versus middle school versus high school, how much of the frontal lobe had been developed, what were the discussions you're having with kids, and... Um, this is something I, I, I do right now in my work is, and this is, I, I know you're an advocate of this, is being very explicit with students about what the definitions are for school safety, for things like uh, bullying, harassment, and then also what, what potential consequences could be of that behavior. Um, but we tend to hide this, you know, th th these things. Uh, one parent uh, contacted me and said, my son uh, shared a image with another student, and now that image is being shared. And you know, now the school police liaison is involved in all of this, and and um, ultimately came down in unpacking all of that of the student saying, "I just I, I wish someone would have had this conversation with me or with my classmates of of what this all can mean because everybody does it. Like everybody was doing this and." Um, and going further back, I remember having a discussion uh, with an administrative team. There was a rash of, of um, bomb threats in area school districts. And my, my thought was, hey, we should, we should tell the students, you know, in especially middle school, high school, if you do this, this is, you know, a, you're crossing into a felony. This is what it's going to mean for you and yeah. your family and all of that. And let's be explicit. Let's not hide it that some people are making very poor decisions and this isn't a joke. And people were saying, oh, don't do that because you're going to give them ideas and they're all going to do, do it. And it didn't happen in our school district at all. And I think that was, was a contributing factor. But um, So, yeah, as, as you've indicated, zero, policy, zero tolerance policies, practices, take away discretion, meaning we can't interpret, we can't morph, we can't look at the situation and the context of what happened. That's all gone. Yeah. Um, we don't look at the, the age, we don't look at the background, the, um, trying to understand why this, this child um, might have come to this point of making this decision. And then also we lose as educators that we're teachers and these are learning opportunities. And everybody right. makes um, mistakes. But, all, you know, school connectedness, um, 
the, the Centers for Disease Control has numerous studies going back 15 years, reports coming out on building up trust with students. We know that through the National Threat Assessment Center, more than 75% of the times when there is a Sentinel event, a school shooting, for example, somebody else knew and they didn't tell. And I think it all comes back into these failed policies, which you're talking about with zero tolerance. So what are you learning in your research? Maybe some examples when of things that have actually happened that illustrate your points. Thank you for tuning in to the Safety Doc Podcast with the nation's leading safety expert, Dr. David Perodin, author, radio show host, university instructor, researcher, expert witness, and consultant. Powerful testimonials. Dr. Perodin has a strong reputation as the go-to safety consultant, and he was still able to exceed our expectations. When we went looking for an expert in the field of crisis preparedness and prevention, David was the single person we pursued. Not easy stepping into the touchier subjects of life, but Dr. David pulls it off. Take a listen. Now, back to Dr. David Perodin and the Safety Doc Podcast. There's a local school here, uh, not the school that I live in, but close by that had, the board decided they would have a zero tolerance for vaping in the secondary schools. And what that meant was that as soon as a child was caught with a vape materials, whether or not they were actually using them, even having the vape materials with them in school, they would receive a citation, a class C misdemeanor from the SRO because the SRO is contracted out from the local law enforcement office, the sheriff's office. So They had a sheriff's office representative right there who could issue the citation. I have to say, I don't think the SROs were thrilled about this. The SROs are not, don't, in this case, and I think this is often the case, don't envision their job to be regular school discipline. And smoking in schools, I mean, that's not new. I'm 50, right? I mean, we've been smoking. In my brother's time, he's older than I am. There were pl- places in the school that were okay for students to go smoke. Right. You know, so this is, you know, to act like this is now all of a sudden, I, I mean, I don't smoke and I certainly don't want my students to smoke. It absolutely is a safety issue. But to immediately introduce every student who brings materials on the campus into the criminal justice system, they go to court, they get a fine, they have to appear before the judge. This can't be safe for students. This can't actually be making a safer situation. As a matter of fact, over the course of only one year of the zero tolerance policy, almost 100 students have been introduced to the criminal justice system through this policy. And that included 18-year-olds for whom that's not a record that will ever go away. And they discovered, unfortunately, that some of the students had or someone had used the vape pen at some point to smoke THC, which is a marijuana substance. And in Texas, any trace of THC oil is a felony. So now we had 18-year-olds that were getting expelled from school, which actually they were, they received um, an alternative program. It was expulsion from the school, but they were sent for the rest of the year to an alternative program. But they're walking out of school with a felony, not with not graduating with their classmates. That's not safer for the community. And then you have students. And what does that mean? That means students aren't going to report, aren't going to talk to other teachers, Absolutely. aren't going to talk to administrators. So you've decreased the connectedness. Absolutely. You've, <laughs> you've prevented all of those things that, you know, behavioral threat assessment folks say have to happen. Students have to feel connected and safe to share information. You've absolutely worked against yourself. Yeah, and so it's the whole youth code of silence. Absolutely. Uh, that, um, yeah, the students are just going to go underground with this. They can't trust the adults anymore because there isn't uh, the opportunity for discretion. So right. immediately, you know, you, you know what the consequence is going to be. So, And it's a cascade effect because if you're not bringing information about, you know, vape, vaping or other things, you're probably not bringing information of the student has said, yeah, they might bring harm to self or harm to others, That's right. um, which could be catastrophic. But again, this is this is ingrained once we have these zero tolerance type of policies 
it kind of just moves things um, under the surface. And so and I, I want to. So I'm yeah. sorry, David. You also decrease connectedness by not allowing for students to have different experiences. Some of these kids probably are addicted to the nicotine and these vaping pens. What we're really doing is saying we don't care about your actual physical addiction rather than, hey, in our community, we can't support this, but we can support you and your health by whatever means. I mean, they could have all kinds of health counselors, mental health count. I don't know what would be involved, but to actually worry about what are the circumstances bringing to the child to not comply with the rule goes out the window when zero tolerance is involved. That yeah. is, is a disinvitation to community. Is a, It's a disinvitation to community. If you don't recognize that there are factors involved in these students' decisions. Well, and I, I completely agree, and, and thanks for adding that. And, you know, so we've got we've we've gotten to the point of how are students informing their schools? Um, have you seen that it's more uh, survey based with students or, you know, student focus groups, which which I advocate um, or are neither of those things happening? Yeah, Marie, what what's happening to to have students be a part of making their schools safe and informed? In terms of like measuring climate, all I, I have only seen surveys being conducted, um, you know, computerized multiple choice surveys with Likert scale sort of questions, you know, most safe or less safe. Um, I have noticed that, if, and specifically that one school that struggled with that zero tolerance policy that was, you know, a top down came from the board. The administration has decided they brought on Four, I think it's four students on their safety committee this year for the first time invited students to participate. And that's been a huge benefit to help the administrators understand how best to communicate with the students. Of what do the students need to know? What do they want to know? What do they think would help? And that's been remarkable change for that campus. Tell us more about that. Uh, we, we spoke previously about conceptualizing school safety um, so we have inter-rate reliability or that one person, their understanding of school safety is, a, is similar to the next person and the next person. So we have four students now, and this is, this is incredible. It's a qualitative process, uh, meaning we're having discussions and, and, you know, surveys. So many schools go the route of surveys, and I, I delineated the inherent flaws to surveys, especially with youth and, and youth with disabilities um, or, or learning English um, it's a hard time to uh, interface with, with surveys, trying to almost guess what the survey is asking. But so these four students come on board um, to help inform of saying, here's what we need to know. Tell me more of, of what changes happen once those students became part of the process. Well, and I should point out, and I think this was a critical part of their decision process, is they selected students that they knew to be in different student groups, different cliques. They weren't necessarily the most successful students or the students that were already on student government or captaining the cheerleading squad or leading the debate team or, you know, band, the drum majors in the band. Not that they picked terrible students either. They, they wanted students that would be responsible and responsive, but they wanted to reach out further than the students they might typically hear from, right? Those students who are right. here were well represented, were able to well represent themselves. Um, and I think that was a critical piece. And in addition to just generally throwing the floor, asking the students, you know, share with us your experiences, they got richer information by bringing to the students, look, here's what we're struggling with. Does this resonate with you? How are the students receiving this? What do you think would make a, b a bigger difference? Um, so they actually, you know, use them as a resource to like mine for information and then left the students still gave them agency over their leadership. So the students yes. could lead some of the projects that they thought would be most helpful to students. So it, it was so it was a specific learning opportunity for those four students as well, which I thought was a great trade off. I think that is such an accolade to uh, school leadership when it is. they're willing to sit down and say, you know, here's what we put together. Here's, you know, we try to get it out in the handbook. We're, we're working with our counselors, but is, 
is this effective? And if not, what do you suggest? And students, when you put that before them, um, the leader, the innate leadership is is there, and um, to yeah, to allow them to be vested in what's happening in their school. As many people have told me, they're surprised once they just open their ears to listen to students and not kind of just give the information one way. Um, so, do you know the the results of? Did anything specifically change on? You know, the students said, listen, like the handbook, nobody reads the handbook. If you're just saying you're responsible for what's in the handbook, come on, no one is going to do that. Anything like that? Well, this was a, sm- we are yet, yet to see the like qual- quantitative results of their discipline because this has only been in place this school year. Last year was when they sent all those kids to the judge with the misdemeanor and felony arrests. But this year we'll see how it actually plays out in terms of you know, the number of kids they catch with vaping materials and, and how they record those discipline of offenses. But one of the changes that I did see, which is very interesting, is the students were like, look, this is happening in the bathrooms and we know which bathrooms it's happening in and we sure. can tell you and here's what you do. Make sure the bathroom doors stay open. If you check the bathroom doors, you can prop them open and there's no way you can still see from the hall. You won't compromise anybody's privacy, like check and see. And so like they made sure to note that like, okay, well, we don't want to leave the bathroom door open if it's going to make students feel unsafe. And so, but the students were able to say, here's the bathrooms you need to focus on. You can prevent this problem. And, and that's what they've done. They've literally left those doors open. They have kind of a new hall pass procedure um, which also helps like minimize the number of students in a hall at a time so that students, because they were finding that students would like collaborate to congregate together out of their various classes at the same time in a particular location. Okay. So they were able to put some simple policies into place that teachers could carry out just in their classrooms that prevented some of this. And it's made a world of difference. And I think a key point is simple. I mean, people look at this and say it's daunting we're going to have to throw away everything and start from scratch and that's typically not the case um as you said students and educators have a discussion and it's you know if we make some of these adjustments let's watch and and our baseline and see what our change from baseline is and made made a big difference you didn't have to go through this And, and that's where people will throw up the hands and say Whoa, once we start this, we don't have the time, we don't have the resources to go over through everything. Just that, not accurate. That administration had at one point, it, they were so frustrated last year and so want, they didn't like having all these kids sent <laughs> to the judge to be involved right. in juvenile court. They don't want that. And they were so frustrated. They were considering this very expensive machinery. I don't even know what the mechanism is, but it's something that you install, I guess, akin to a smoke detector, but it's designed to also, like, be sensitive enough to to see, to have a signal if there's vaping going on. Okay. Or so, but it was like this, and they were like, I, we can't even tell how effective this is. This is like a new technology. We don't know anybody that's had experience with it. It's so expensive. Will this really be worth it? You know, it's so, so much better of a solution to just ask the students. And the students say, look, we know where it's happening. Prop the doors open and they can't do it. Yeah, completely makes sense. Um, so two things I, I, I want to go back to. One is when you were mentioning students going before the judge, um, I'm just trying to put myself back into, you know, a 16, 17-year-old younger me I'd be terrified by that. Yes. I would yeah. absolutely not be sleeping, um, eating. I would be a wreck. And it probably is, you know, a, a case where the judge is, is going to at least, you know, give a pretty firm statement to put an end to this. That that's not going to be a real comfortable meeting before the judge. But, um, but yeah, that is terrifying for me yeah. even to, to just try to, to envision myself um, in that situation. And as you've said, you know, uh, solutions such as, as making sure that the doors aren't closed, but some potential movement by administration to listen, we can't keep dealing with this and we're not getting anywhere. So a vendor comes in and says, listen, I have a device which will detect vape smoke and maybe put something 
specific on a screen of saying it's this bathroom at this time and then you know someone can get dispatched there and and all of these things are pretty wild and we see them ubiquitous in school safety um, it's a three billion dollar industry and it, it just keeps going on and on and i think it's because people look for they look to outsource solutions yeah. um, instead of looking internally to solve things so this was a, this is a wonderful example emory because um, this is what needs to happen on all levels of school safety. Students and a cross section of students and uh, administration having an honest discuss discussion, and also for administration to say, "Listen, this isn't working, and we're not going to double down on our position," <laughs> because that becomes um, ingrained in in educators also sometimes yes. principles of saying um, i'm not going to admit that this policy or this practice isn't working um, and we just need to do that we need to sometimes say hey um, this isn't getting our outcome so we need to do something different i need you to help me with that i'm going to give an example of, of something i've become aware of and and have you kind of processed through it because it is a zero tolerance situation it is a high school that has a zero tolerance policy for wearing your ID, your student ID. So if you don't wear it, you instantly get a detention. And then if it's multiple times, it goes up from there. But there is no, ooh, I forgot it or I have a different shirt on today than where my ID was or whatever it was. Um, immediately, it's ineffective in the school um, as far as it's not decreasing um, the number of students who are, um, you know, wearing, uh, it, it's not increasing compliance, okay? So right. we, we know that. It's not increasing compliance. The kids are thinking it's ridiculous. The parents are thinking it's ridiculous and asking to meet. The administrators um, have so far had the response of saying, this is for school safety without elaborating. It's for school safety, and we need the kids to do this. Um, and kids are taking, like, the IDs and, and morphing. They're printing their own IDs, spoof IDs. Like of they, course. Uh, yeah, of course, you know. <laughs> so, yes, I'm yeah, Luke Skywalker or McLovin or whatever it is just to see how long they can get away with it. And some key questions have come up in this, this situation. One is, what are your priorities for school safety, uh, meaning uh, in, in making sure that um, – your, your doors are locked, your PA system works, two-way radios, all of these types of things. And then where does this fall? If you had to rank everything, where would this fall? Another question, and we've talked about it, how about your relationship with students? Is this really where you want to butt heads with your students and, and, and put a, a wedge between your administration, your students over IDs when there are so many more things which are important? And also, as you said, Emory, um, we want students to come forward with uh, information. We want them to have conversations with staff. And that's just not going to happen if you, if you have this type of situation in place. And the third thing, which um, you talked about also, schools, I've seen this more in the last year, I think, than I've seen it ever before. But schools taking what is traditionally discipline, smoking, ID, and now that is being turned over to the SRO, the yep. police officer saying, you deal with this. You're basically now dealing with all discipline. And, and the SRO is like, come on, like this is school discipline. This is you, principal. Um, and in the case I've just mentioned with the IDs, parents have approached that school district and have asked to meet with the principals to try to understand how what can we do to make this better? Because, right. yeah, the kids don't like it. We don't like it. Um, and what the school district did is they said, okay, you can meet with our SRO. <laughs> and our SRO will tell you why this has to be in place versus, like, you know, having the administrators there. So it is this really weird handoff we're having right now of SROs um, being the ones to enforce what traditionally have been principal or even classroom teachers enforcing. So I, I put that scenario out there. Um, give me your thoughts on, on that and maybe even how to make that better.
a must read for parents, teachers, and taxpayers. Dr. David Perodin has written the most honest book about the three billion dollar school safety industrial complex. Attorney James Sibley proclaims, a brave demonstration of speaking truth to power. School of Errors rips the lid off the billion dollar school safety industry. Using real world examples of successful responses in desperate situations, David contrasts the expensive window dressings pitched to panic parents with the inexpensive and effective approaches proven to actually work. Read this book before you let your school waste another precious dollar on meaningless safety theater. Buy the international bestseller, School of Errors, Rethinking School Safety in America, now at Barnes & Noble or Amazon. Well, let me say this with regard to SROs. I've worked with many SROs, and most of them are fabulous people. They truly are, and they're interested in being a positive part of the school community and connecting with students. That is the large part of what I've seen. At the same time, there is a certain weight to the idea of being a sworn officer of the law in uniform with a gun on campuses. They just represent something very unique and different to the students than another school staff member. So we have to be very careful in navigating that relationship, however awesome the SRO is personally. I'd like to also point out, and I think that this is really important, is that the SROs do bring a particular expertise to the school community, but that expertise rarely in, includes um, knowledge about adolescent development or special needs or um, social and emotional learning, many of the things that educators have expertise in. So handing over what should have, what has been and should be the purview of educators to SROs is especially problematic when they're not equipped. That's not their expertise. They're not equipped to have those same decision processes that we are. Um, that's not their training. That's not their education. That's not their professional background. Very few states actually have specialized training for SROs at all. So if people are imagining that school resource officers are coming with some kind of specialized school policing training, that is very rarely the case. Now, in Texas, by law, we have now, starting next year, it was just signed into law, like, I think it was July this year. So it's new. In Texas, they will receive some specialized training. But we're one of the few states that has any, and even that is pretty limited. It can be accomplished in two days. Okay. So, I mean, compare that to somebody like you who's an administrator who has multiple graduate degrees, right? You can't, it's just a very different perspective and you want to ask whose perspective do you want to lead this discussion? Who's dis whose perspective do you want to be in charge of, of the decision process when it comes to best outcomes for students? Let's tap into the SRO's expertise appropriately. Let's not put them in a position that they're not equipped to be in. And frankly, most of the ones I've seen don't want to be in the position of enforcing school discipline. That's not how they perceive their role. So I will say that with regard to the to the ID wearing. So here's here's something that challenges me as an adult. We don't. I feel like we tend to forget that students are individuals, too. Like, so imagine the student that runs to school. You don't know what happened that previous 12 hours at home. You don't know if they spent the night in the ER because mom got sick and there's nobody else to watch that kid. So he sat in the ER all day and barely made it to school. And now you're going to slap him on the hand for not having his ID with him? You, if you don't have the discretion to ask those kind of questions about the circumstances behind the noncompliance, then you have absolutely distanced that child from the school experience, which is not only detrimental to his safety and a whole school's safety, but his academic outcomes. It increases discipline problems for that student, and it just becomes a vicious cycle. And you can say, okay, well, an ID, like how hard is that to comply with? I don't know. What about the kid who has their arm in a sling, maybe? And it makes it especially hard to wear that loop thing. Maybe the, I mean, I don't know what all the circumstances are. What about a girl who's been victimized? And there's an unfortunate high percentage of student, girl students who have been sexually victimized, and they feel like people are staring at their chest if they wear that. And they don't feel comfortable sharing that information. You know, 
there are reasons for noncompliance aside from just, you know, forgetfulness, which I suppose is what the idea is behind the zero tolerance. It's like, we're going to teach you not to forget this. But we allow adults that discretion. Right. If I had to wear an ID at my workplace and I showed up one day and I was like, oh, my gosh, I spent up, I spent all night with my kid. He was sick. He was up vomiting. I knew I had to be here for this meeting. I'm sorry, guys. I forgot my ID. Can somebody let me in the door? Nobody would bat an eye. Why can't we give that, that space to students who are far less equipped to adjust because of their brain development than right. I am? And, and Anne, um, the response from uh, the principals is this has to be maintained at, you know, zero tolerance for IDs because of school safety. So when the, the parents come back and ask the principals, well, exactly how does this promote safe schools? Like exactly right. how did you arrive at this decision or was it the school board uh, that, you know, it, it arrived at or was this some committee? And it came, But help us to understand what brought this forward what's the basis for this and then it stops right there it's like it's for school safety and that again it becomes a, a term which people start to instantly realize they can't really define it so they they just put it out as a shield if it says school safety if anything it, customer perceived value right um if you believe that what you're doing has a chance to make the school safer by all means do it and yep. no matter you know, what you have to do to enforce it, how much it costs, things like that. And we don't go deeper, as as you said, into the conceptualization, um, into the frameworks of why are we really doing this? What does it have to do with school safety? So I know you've done a lot of work there. Help me to understand when people talk about school safety, how can they actually make sure that they're all having a conversation of a, of a similar concept of okay, this is what school safety is. I wish I had a better answer. I have more questions than answers at this point, and that's because I don't think the research has really been based in the conceptual work about what school safety means. We've kind of had this knee-jerk reaction and invoked this moral panic about school safety. And listen, as a mom, I'm, I get it. I want my kids to be safe. I mean, it's it's sine qua non for schools. You you have to have a safe school environment. I you know anything else that happens is gravy, right? If you don't have a safe school environment, so I right. I'm a hundred percent in. But then I have to ask, who's safety? How safety? You know, the school IDs I presume are part of a a larger access control kind of project, like the way that we lock down buildings or we have to ring a bell to get into the the main office outside of school or inside school hours or there's like these raptor systems with the create ids and all that stuff that's around access right. to the building itself and and i can appreciate that at the same time we know in practice having worked in schools having students yes. in schools there is it's of limited use my kids high school for example at any given moment, there are literally hundreds of kids in trailers outside of schools, in the outside of the school, in classrooms, which is I don't know how what it's like in Wisconsin. In Texas, that's not uncommon. We we house students in portable buildings or temporary buildings on campuses all over Austin. It, it's it's very normal. I think Austin ISD has like 600 portables. Last time yeah. I looked it up. That's fine. I'm not saying that's a problem necessarily. What I'm saying is if you're locking down the main building and you have 100 or 200 students in portables, what good have you done? Absolutely. I Absolutely. And, 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 and there's so many, you know, 4K community sites. Um, so we overlook those too. But um, the point you're making with the portables, uh, Washington State, uh, there was an article about uh, the, the growing number of portable classrooms and saying exactly what you're saying right now. Listen, we lock down the typical brick and mortar building, but then we have these buildings, and, and often it's to the lowest bidder. Uh, and I remember, you know, being on, uh, being an administrator when the discussion had to come up about portables because you put them out there until you could pass a referendum to make an addition or a new sure. building. So they also didn't have the same standards, but. Um, but yeah, so what does an ID look like? And, and you had a terrific point before. So let's say that you are a, a teacher and, and you're like, I forgot my ID. I don't have it with me today because, you know, this, this, this. And what's going to happen? They're going to say, okay, Anne-Marie, you, you forgot it. No, you know, 
just nothing. Nothing's going to happen because that's what we do as adults. And, and we know that um, these types of things are just typical. They happen to all of us. Right. Um, so, and, and I, I'm thinking about this too. How about itinerant staff that work between buildings or somebody that shows up um, or, or parents? Um, what, what's the fidelity also making sure that they check in at the front doors? Like, hey, I know you, HVAC. Um, I teach a class for superintendents. It's, it's a superintendent legal class. I teach it on Saturdays. And I showed a video last week. It's a three-minute video. You can find it on YouTube, but it, it's, it, it's carrying a ladder. Um, if you carry a ladder, you can get into basically any place that you want and you don't have to come up with elaborate cover stories and all of that it's like you just have a ladder just normal you know shirt and and pants and it's amazing you can get into movie theaters and things like that because people are like there's a ladder that person i guess should be here they seem like they know what they're doing so there are many reasons yeah that these systems don't make sense and also have you in your research have you observed um this continued maybe I call it doubling down or people entrenching in to the, these positions where things aren't working, but I'm not going to admit it's not working. I think people do that because they, they don't want to admit that the idea is, is flawed and they take it personally. Like someone's going to look at me and say, you should have known better. I'm like, Oh, I always encourage people the other way. I'm like, I think it really shows a lot if you're saying, hey, what we have here isn't achieving the outcome. We need to rethink it. I have some ownership in that, um, but I have some ownership in the solution. So a lot of fear. School boards also turn over frequently. Yes. So it's hard to get continuity. Administrators turn over. Um, and school boards are the, I mean, it, it's a basic form of entry into government. So you, you run for a school board, and once those folks get on, I mean, they're hearing a lot about what school safety is from the media. Like they, right. their, their background, the longer they're on the board, the further they can become educated to what's happening in the district and the administrators and teachers can, and students can educate them. But that's why we get some of these crazy ideas, um, I think, happening. But um, so, so tell me, I mean, are you, are you seeing people, administrators, you gave one example of being more open or are you still seeing this, this doubling down or even how, have you looked into organizations like what are what's a national SRO organization what is national school boards what what kind of guidance might they be giving I I I can't speak to that to be honest with you I I know that one thing I know is that the the way that the National Association of SROs kind of describes the work of school police officers they have a triad model that describes them as being mentors and counselors and law enforcement officers, but research evidence doesn't suggest that SROs actually agree that that's their, they don't see their job as some equilateral balance of those three elements. They see it as largely law enforcement. Um, if, if there is any consensus, that's what it is. So I'm not sure if the guidance is yet caught up with like lived practices and I don't know about National School Board Organization, but that's a good question. Um, what I can say is that when the, commu the school community at large is invited into this discussion, it ends up having greater effect. What I mean is inviting a parents, inviting students to sit on that decision-making process. The, the larger, the more stakeholders you can get involved, the better your outcomes are going to be. And maybe, I, I don't know, this is just a thought. Remind educators that this is part and parcel of what we do. This, this right. is classroom work, right? You, you, have a, you have a goal. You try to achieve that goal. You design your funky lesson. You've got your great practice. You give a test. Wow, it didn't meet the outcome I expected. So let me revamp. Let me rethink. Let me retool, reteach. We'll go again because I still want the outcome to be this. Well, if your outcome is safe for schools, we need to figure out what that means and what you're actually trying to measure. So right there, Amory, um, talking about outcomes, um, help me to understand what a learning objective might look like. So you're getting people together to have this discussion um, and they're saying, OK, yes, we want safer schools. Um, how do you see that as as manifesting into one or two learning objectives? Well, you know, I think it would be great to have a discussion about 
okay, what does that look like? What does a safe school look like? Let's describe it as detailed as we can. I mean, this is kind of what they've done in industry, right? They've had to decide what's, what does a safe workspace look like? Does that mean a reduction in, in injuries and a reduction of harm? Does that mean a space where you have mental health safety? What are all the components? Let's get as detailed as we can about what safe means. And who safe applies to should be part of that question. Because if we're marginalizing certain students through our zero discipline policies, then we have made it safe probably for white kids, probably for boys, you know, and less safe for kids of color. Um, that's significant. If, we, if we're creating disequity, we are no, in no way, shape, or form creating school safety. Tell me what you're finding in your research um, with this equity. What I'm finding is that we, ha here's one of the most interesting things that I've found. In the literature for, from criminal justice research, the relationship between the interactions between youth and police in general, outside of a school context, okay are not necessarily as highly impacted on the SROs, or excuse me, the police officers' actions. There's been a presumption that the way this police officer behaves in a particular incident will have a huge impact on how the youth perceive the police in general and that interaction specifically. But in fact, that really depends on your race. That's, prob that's true, it seems to be, for white students. That they have, if, they, if white kids have a particular interaction with a cop, that cop's behavior and that perception of that specific interaction has a great impact on that student's, that kid's perception of police in general. But that's less true of kids of color. They come with a much more nuanced and richer and different background and information about what police are and what policing means because of their, usually because of their community experience or maybe even personal familial experience. So when we, one of, the, one of the things I'm concerned about is when we focus all our attention on getting SROs to behave a certain way or behave differently because that's going to improve kids' perceptions of safety, now we're really focusing on white kids' perceptions of safety because the SRO's behavior is not as impactful on how students of color feel about their perceptions of safety. So we need, it, it's, it may feel nuanced, but it's really significant to really think about all the subpopulations that are involved. It, you know, there's been some interesting research about subpopulations of students' perceptions of safety in the presence of a school resource officer, and the school resource officer's actions and that student's involvement personally with the resource officer does not have a great significant effect on the student's perception of SROs. Okay. It's not what we think. So we need to really understand if we're measuring safety by students' perception of safety, we're really missing the beat here. And with perception, again, most of that is probably coming from surveys, which already have innate flaws right. um, built into them. Um, yeah, because uh, to build a, to build a a good survey, you have to have constructs or basically what your themes are right. um, and, and make sure that you have readability, if you have students with disabilities, for example, um, right. that they are able to um, understand the, the terms, the, the way that the question, what it's, what it's asking. Um, so, so yeah, the way that we're, we're harvesting information, I, I'll never forget, I was at a school once uh, doing some consulting and we were talking about surveys and the principal said, oh, just wait a second, and fired up a laptop, and I, I was con continuing to present and some things like that, and 10 minutes later, said, I got the survey done. Here it is. I can send it out on, on Google Docs to all the students. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> like, no, don't do that, please. Um, if you're going to put together a survey, this will take, you know, several hours to put together a survey. That, and, and, again, it's, it's this... Um, People don't understand surveys, and they think it's a simple way, but actually, it's very complex. So, we and when you t when you were talking about learning objectives, so um, you know this this could be the Anne Marie book, you know, learning objectives for educators. This was so spot on um, reductions in injuries, 
um, for example, you're talking about a workplace. How could you measure um, safety? And it, right. right, reduction injuries. You'd have a, a number of your starting point, your baseline, and then you'd have some amount of time that would pass, and then you would, you'd see, are we higher or lower? Um, and then people also tend to think if, if they put something in place and the numbers don't go in the direction that they think, that's bad. Like if it goes, you know, you do this student ID thing and all of a sudden you have more students getting detentions and, and stuff. It's like, well, that just tells you, no, you've, you've gone in a direction. Yeah, you don't want to go. So now let's retool it and work our way back to a baseline and try to make a change to baseline to, to getting, you know, less detentions. And um, So something's flawed in the system. That's sure. what it's telling you. But uh, yeah, learning objectives are completely overlooked in most districts. The learning objectives for safety. What do we what do we try to understand? Um, you, you talked about how students um, interact with SROs and just with law enforcement. You know, as, as you've indicated, we have we need to have all of our students represented, and all of our students. Um, so our our professional development is reaching um, as many students as we can. So I want to go back because I, I think you have more. Um, to bring forward in this area. But so you indicate through your research and through your anecdotal findings, um, students of color, um, what, what are components to help students of color have successful interactions with SROs or vice versa? SROs have successful interactions with students of color. I can say that I do not know the answer to that. I do not know, but we need to ask that question. Yeah. And I think not having asked the question is already problematic. Not having recognized that there's a question there to be asked is problematic. So we need, again, I feel like this is part of the conceptual work we need to do around school safety. We need to dial back a minute and find what, what are we asking? What do we need to know? What, how are we conceiving of this idea? It's really important. Um, I'm concerned about... Um, I, I know this is happening locally, that there are recently there are trainings to teach kids how to um, interact with law enforcement. That feels like a dangerous step to me. I can't put up, I mean, I can't speak to that from a research perspective. As a mom, I'm not sure that's where we need to be going. <laughs> you know, it, it feels to me like it's the adults, it's those in authority, it's those with the law enforcement background that need to be in charge of that interaction. And to have to teach people how to interact safely with them seems problematic. Thank you for tuning in to the Safety Doc Podcast with the nation's leading safety expert, Dr. David Perodin, author, radio show host, university instructor, researcher, expert witness, and consultant. Powerful testimonials. Dr. Perodin has a strong reputation as the go-to safety consultant, and he was still able to exceed our expectations. When we went looking for an expert in the field of crisis preparedness and prevention, David was the single person we pursued. Not easy stepping into the touchier subjects of life, but Dr. David pulls it off. Take a listen. Now, back to Dr. David Perodin and the Safety Doc Podcast. <laughs> to me, this is a problem, like, philosophically, that an agent of the state demands respectful interaction. You know, it, they, they are agents of the state. So why is free speech not still protected? Of course, I don't want my students or myself or my children to be rude or disrespectful to law officers, just like I wouldn't want them to be to anyone. But I wouldn't want the outcome of that interaction to hinge on whether or not they were perceived to be rude by the police officer. And so if we're like training as though that's the fundamental that's missing, that students aren't behaving respectfully enough, then we kind of turn things on their head. The law enforcement is there to serve us and protect us. And so to ask us to then conscribe, circumscribe our free speech in order to make that interaction safe for us seems fast backwards. Yeah. That's, and that's just my, you know, 
I, I Marie, can't speak from the research, but that is that's the concern I have. And and to to step that down the road a little bit, um, it really is also saying or conveying the message of um, debate isn't welcomed. Right. Um, so whether it's in that specific setting or um, in some other setting, I mean, we used to, uh, when I grew up, debate was on TV. The high school debate team Saturday at six o'clock, and they'd all, you know, be in front of of the uh, podiums, and, and they would go back and forth, and and um, that was big, right? And nobody teaches that anymore. Um, and de- you know, debate. The purpose of debate is to put you know, your your positions, your information, your knowledge base out there, another person on a, on a shared topic, and hopefully or your intent is to persuade them. But if you are unable to persuade them, then you respect what they present it, you respect the outcome, and you move on. But we are so much not there as a society. We're not there with kids. We, we don't teach kids the basic skills of debate. It's either it's my position, this is what I want, and because you don't want it, you're wrong. And that goes both ways. And it goes at, you know, adults to kids, too, of debate is just gone. Yeah. So I think that's a fundamental part. Um, and as, as you talked about earlier, the school district that had four students come on to their safety committee, basically they're inviting those students at some level of um, introductory debate. Yes. Of, of having their positions validating, but maybe saying, here's where we're at, students coming back, but okay, here's this, and, and back and forth. And that's healthy. Like, that's been around for centuries, and suddenly it's it's been pushed away. <laughs> I think we dismiss the importance of asking a question. Like, it's okay to ask a question without an idea of what the answer should be. With we don't start with the question, we're never going to find the answer. But it seems like there's such a privilege on having an answer, having a response all yes. the time now. And I think it's okay to open the floor and say, "What do we think? What are we thinking? What are the questions that we need to be asking? And why are those the questions? And what are the tangential questions related to that?" And when we 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 know to ask the, the W questions, right? Why don't we do that around school safety? Why aren't we asking the what, the who, the why, the where around every school safety decision? Uh. And Emory, uh, again, I, I am in complete agreement with that. We have become extremely linear in school safety. People are convinced that um, there is one convergent solution to every school safety issue and that also you can um, have every contingency covered. I remember working with a school district uh, out on the west coast and in their very thick binder of all of their school safety contingencies they had a section and it was plane falls from sky and I'm like well what's what is this all about and you're are you're not is there an airport here is has something happened in the past and they just said they they worked it back, and at some point, you know, 10 years ago, some person advised them that they needed to have this, and, and they put it in. So I said, well, get rid of that, because that's unlikely, and if it happens, you're probably not going to follow your 35 steps here anyway. Um, so the process, um, I, I think that you're, you're talking about with asking the questions is called the infinity process. And I'm just saying I, I had a university instructor who brought us through the infinity process of how to um, get people to bring forward questions yes. and, and be very, um, first, get all of the questions out there. That's the infinity process. And then realize to get to whatever outcome you want. Okay. So, so whatever that outcome is. So, you know, as, as you said, if it's like school safety, reducing injuries or, or, you know, so let's say that's it. How do we get to that? And realize it's not going to be a straight line of A to B. Um, it can be A to B to C to D to E to F to G, and then finally you're there. And that's okay because that might be the way it needs to work for some buildings, for some students, some parents, some situations. Right. And in, in my book, I wrote about that um, specifically in the term simulated annealing, which I didn't know anything about before I started to write the book. So... <laughs> It was Dr. Paul Rapp, head of military medicine. We were having a discussion, and he said, what you're talking about, Dave, kind of sounds like simulated annealing. I'm like, that's great. What is it? <laughs> he said, well, it's basically, yeah, you know, if you have a flight from 
um, Chicago to San Francisco and the flight gets canceled. And now you have to take like three other flights and basically to get there, it's kind of simulating. Like, okay, I got it. So, but yes, we, we don't encourage people to bring up questions and we also make people feel and students feel, and, and these are where zero tolerance is, right? Zero tolerance is a, this is a, this is B, this is That's the right. only way to get there. Yep. <laughs> it is our standard operating procedure and there's, there's no way to adjust that. And it's like, that's crazy because we know, I mean, if we just look at a simple map, I mean, back in the days, I guess, when we used to have the maps that you can never fold back up and put into the, the glove box. But, um, you know, there are many ways to get to your outcome. And that's going to suit the person for the situation and the context. Um, this is so, and I, I, I want to go through and, and just make sure I'm touching on this is this has been incredibly informative. Um, yeah, it's been great talking to you too. I, I think that you brought it right back to zero tolerance. If zero tolerance privileges compliance, if zero tolerance privileges this linear method, then we're missing opportunities to teach kids to have the critical skills to respond to unusual situations. So they don't have to have a binder full of responses that will never work anyway. Right. Yeah. I am, I'm always amazed because when something happens that makes the mainstream media of, again, a student being, you know, a kindergartner, first grader out of school because of, or, or something where they, they said something to another student on the, the playground, um, people always email me and, and say, what do you think about this? And so, well, you know, from the article, here's what I think in general about zero tolerance and processes like this, as, as we've indicated today, you need to have the ability to apply discretion. Schools are learning environment. Is there a genuine risk for harm of someone? Right. Um, and, you know, also for just watching TV, you know, the, the movies that come out, you know, the Joker trailers, uh, you know, that, that came out, if kids are seeing those. Um, and my goodness, like, um, you know, it's, it's, it's so weird because like, Oh, the kids in my neighborhood have all of the new Nerf guns, so they're running around. And I had to take one of them off my roof the other day, one of the the Nerf bullets or whatever. And um, but yet, you know, if that was not in this context of of kids playing in a neighborhood, um, and in that, uh, you know, I live two blocks from a school. What if they go down to a school setting and now it's on a school? So that's it, right. I think when people lock themselves, not think, I know when people lock themselves into zero tolerance, it almost always hits some scenario that doesn't fit zero tolerance, and then it starts to just force that scenario down a very abrasive path. And everybody knows it's wrong. Like, the administrators know, the parents know, the kids know, they're like, this isn't right. And people say, but it's our policy. This is what our policy says. And yeah. Um, I always, to me, that's a cowardly position. It's a yes. cowardly position to just hide behind and say, this is what our policy is. Because, you know, in this case, it didn't work. And maybe in other cases, it's not working. And I'm going to move us back because the, as, as you've done research, um, I've looked at the state and national organizations. We talk about school boards, but there's so many others for school leaders and different, you know, uh, SROs and, um, but, when I look at those organizations, it seems that they they aren't having the discussions, obviously, that we are having. And their professional development tends to be the softballs that get, get tossed out there of, um, you know, teacher retention or topics like that, which you can present in pretty general terms and it can apply to everybody. But not these these harder topics of saying, you know, how are we going to put learning objectives to school safety? How are we going to define how are we going to get interrated reliability? As an organization, what leadership can we give to you? And I've challenged organizations on that. And when I instruct my superintendents, my school administrators, I always say, because um, we, we've had the discussions that you, you talked about, you know, vaping. We talked about student IDs, defining safety. And, and I'll pause and say, what are your state and national organizations telling you about this? And they'll say, it's just general stuff, general articles we're not getting. So that's where you have to push people more. And that's how we become better. And, it, and we, we have to realize zero tolerance doesn't work. You've indicated it. It hasn't. Um, 
I remember it was the 90s, right? Zero tolerance came into play. I think it was after uh, um, California had a no broken windows policy they were enforcing with police. And what that meant was if um, a building had broken windows, they were fined and they needed to to fix the windows. Kind of goes back even to, to New York City in the 80s when they were sure. taking graffiti out of subway saying, if we can address things at this level, it will have a, a ripple up effect where we won't have other more significant crime or, um, but, but yeah, it's, it's not working. It's alienating kids, right. a document. And, and as we wrap up the centers for disease control has research school connectedness. Um, what's your experience with, um, school connectedness as a researcher or as an educator? How did you become aware of it? Was this something when you were in the classroom that any professional development came out and said, Hey, the CDC in 2009 came out with this incredible, um, st- you know, multiple studies all in, in one, a meta-analysis saying, if we can get kids connected to school, trusting that if they have a relationship with their, their teachers, with each other, if they're putting, bringing forward information, it'll be acted upon in a thoughtful manner. The school, they'll, they'll perform better academically. They'll be less truant. They'll be less violence. All of these things, which have been proven out again in their, their, I think it was 2018 or 2019 study. So my question to you is, as an educator, did you, how did you become, or did you not become aware of any of these things? Well, connectedness resonates with every topic, doesn't it? I mean, connect, you know, there's a professor in my program that's very involved in community education and community development. It's all about connectedness. It, it, that's the center of what he studies is that that connectedness to community is essential to having a successful learning environment. Um, it, like you said, the people that do behavioral threat assessment. I was, I've attended that training multiple times and invariably it's always connection 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 is the key to school safety students have to feel connected to the school community students have to feel connected to an adult in the school community i mean it resonates everywhere you turn in education so we need to make sure that it really truly resonates in the decisions we make around school policing and school safety in general and emory so uh 10 years ago um uh, you're in, in the classroom correct so when you were in the classroom, um, what, was this ever a part of professional development for you, specifically school connectedness? It was not. Not okay. then. Not in the 90s. Okay. Um, and how about now? I mean, are you seeing that this is this is coming forward for professional development for educators, or are we still behind on saying, we know this, now we need you to know this? I, I think where I see it right now... Uh, as I have to think about that more to give you a more substantive uh, answer. But one thing I do see is this trend toward culturally, culturally responsive school leadership, building on culturally responsive pedagogy from Ladson Buildings and Crenshaw and all those folks. Right. So there's this whole school leadership component now that's like, look, we have to have culturally responsive leadership to create communities that actually are connected, are fully connected. Otherwise, we're disinviting certain folks and that it works against connectedness. So I do see that. And I think that there is definitely a movement that direction. I don't know how well that's filtered down into pre-service teacher training or even principal right. training yet, but we'll see. I, I see it as an important trend for sure. And I I, Khalifa Gooden and Davis have something. Jen Jacobs has something on this. Uh, people are definitely responding to that idea. And I think um, I think that's a, an opportunity when you talked about um, introducing learning objectives into school safety, even looking at what professional development educators are receiving or attending and then charting it and looking at, okay, is, is, is this teaching school connectedness? And, and I, I guess what is being conveyed by this? And that's your baseline and then saying, Going forward, we are going to increase professional development opportunities for our staff um, specific to school connectedness and then being able to align your professional development to school connectedness and, yeah, start to see change from there. Uh, that, that, is, that is a perfect uh, stepping stone off of what you just shared. And, see, that's the hard part, I think, for schools is they, they just don't know where to start. 
And you've given them at least three or four points today that they can instantly come back and say, this is what I want to do. Um, so before we close, um, I want to thank you for ordering and reading my book, School of Errors. If you can, you know, share with us, you know, one or two thoughts, the impact that the book had um, on you and maybe how it you've shared it with others. It's, it's modified some uh, of your practice or if not, or be interested to hear that. Um, one of the things that resonated with me specifically as a Gen Xer myself is that I've noticed, and I know that my parents said this as boomers or, you know, actually they were like almost bridge boomer and great generation. They're older folks, but that the, the area around which and this, um, and the freedom that we've given kids over several generations has shrunk immensely. And while we did that out of, an idea that we were protecting their safety, I think it's had some dangerous ramifications that's actually ended up compromising kids' safety. What I mean is, you know, my son doesn't go, he's 14, and he now, I mean, he rides his bike with his friends a little further afield, but that's only been in the last couple of years, maybe age 12, that he's gone further than maybe the next, you know, four or six houses on the block by himself without adult supervision. Right. That's crazy. When I was 12, we were, I mean, my parents didn't know where we were necessarily. We were given parameters, right. right? And I suppose if I had proven myself untrustworthy, I would have been given more strict parameters. Right. But, you know, we were at the club or we were at Kristen's house or wherever yeah. we were. Um, I think that's been dangerous for kids to not have those outdoor experiences, to not have those individual experiences. I would rather a kid climb a tree and break an arm and learn how to do that than to never get the opportunity to break an arm and have no idea how to respond if something happens to them out and about. Um, I know that sounds harsh, but I, I have, <laughs> I've seen so many places, so many schools that talk to kids about not being risk adverse, be a, um, you know, to be, to be risk takers, to be, but what they're only meaning is intellectual risk taking because they yes. tell the kids at the same time, don't run on the blacktop, right. don't climb a tree. <laughs> I sent my girls to Girl Scout camp one time at a public park for a week. And one of the rules is they could not run. Oh my goodness. Wow. I don't understand that thinking. No, no. I don't understand that thinking. If we're not giving them the opportunity to fall down, what's right. going to happen when they invariably do? My uh, Emory, my elementary school that I attended, my K-8 building, um, was 100 years old back then. And the playground was tilted at about a 30-degree angle, and it was all blacktop. And it was that old blacktop that had the three-inch stones embedded in it. So yes, imagine yes. <laughs> you get a new pair of jeans, and like the first day, the knees would be gone. Sure. Um, but that's just the way that it was. Um, and we also had in my, I had a small town, 1500 I grew up in river went through it and it has swinging bridge. So you could get from one side to the other. If the, the main bridge um, was, was flooded out and you could really get that thing swinging as a 10 year old. And we were always down there doing that and nobody ever fell out, but now it's been all chained up and, and things like that. But um, the, the point you're talking about in the book is I wrote about, mm -hmm. there was a school district outside of Cleveland, Ohio, and their eighth grade class trip, they canceled. The parents canceled it because they thought Washington, D.C. was just too dangerous for the kids to go there. Um, and ultimately, the 100 years ago, the typical eight-year-old could go 30 miles around their house. That was their Rome zone, you know, unsupervised. And now it's less than a mile for that same eight-year-old. And it is terrifying because, yeah, the moment you encounter something that's a little bit unusual, whether it be a different neighborhood something like that, unusual weather, whatever. Um, it, it's this panic because you haven't been there before. You haven't had the chance for reconnaissance and the, the chance to learn about it. So, um, yeah, that, that's an amazing part um, of the book. And it is really the, the almost the un, unlearning um, as, as you go through. For, for some people who have contacted me with the book of saying, um, yeah, thanks for, for putting this together and, Anyway, yeah. um, I'm yeah. so thankful because, um, you know, as you're very intellectual as, as a researcher, also into school safety, um, for you to, to 
identify those points of the book. I mean, it's it's very um, meaningful for me because that, that obviously is what I was attempting to do. So today, Anne-Marie Kotman on the Safety Doc podcast, she is um, completing her doctoral dissertation now in Texas State University. Anne-Marie, um, when do you think you're going to do your defense? I'm aiming for April of 21. Okay. All right. Any um, any uh, nervousness with that, or do you feel like because <laughs> I have a I have a wonderful crazy story to to share? Oh, I'd love to hear your story. No, I'm not nervous, but maybe that's yet to come. <laughs> okay. So one is uh, this is an incredible process. I am so glad that I obtained my PhD from University of Wisconsin Madison. You're you're on a wonderful path. I I thought this was the one. When you get a PhD, then you're really researching and working for yourself. I mean, you're not completing requisites and all of this. And I, I think right. the growth is immense. So um, I, w- I had s- scheduled my my dissertation defense, and I could have one person present. So I asked my priest if he would be there. So he shows up, and he brings in food for everybody because you have to do that also, apparently, yeah. at least up here for your, your yeah. dissertation committee. And it's really nice. It was really great. Um, and I was all set to go. Like my, uh, my, my main person was saying, this looks good. Everything should be fine. And I made a mistake, though. There was a school shooting that happened in Wisconsin the day before my defense. And I thought I would bring that in and start things off of why my de- whole research was relevant. And that was a mistake. Um, and... I got into it about 10 or 15 minutes and I got shut down by the the team. They said, this isn't what your defense, you know, is your research is about. You're talking about contemporary issues. You need to regather and come back. And I was like, oh, my goodness, I've brought a priest. Like, come on. But uh, (laughs) and I got done and I was just kind of stunned and, you know, came back. I think it was a week or two later and then gave the presentation, you know, defend it and everything was fine. I can't wait to get your, you know, research and, and you know, one, once you've defended and, and then once you're published. Um, and, yeah, this is, Amory, this is so needed because um, people are fuzzy with also the role of an SRO. Yeah. Um, zero tolerance um, needs some logical discussion around it. So, you know, you're bringing all of these things to the forefront right now. These are very critical discussions that need to happen. And as I look at your work, I would describe it as an easement into very uh, much needed discussions where people are kind of standing around the outside saying, yeah, I need to get into this. I need to learn more about this. I need to discuss, but I just don't know which door to open. Like, I don't know or I don't have the key. And you're providing that to them in your work, which is so important. Um, and I just, I, I can't share with people enough of, this is, you are exceptional. You're an exceptional researcher. You're, you're, you're very well thought out. Um, and your contributions, I think, are, are just beginning in, in this whole area of um, school safety and, and the interface of school policing. So just thank you for the work that you're doing. Well, thank you, David. I can't tell you how much I appreciated getting your book and learning of you and connecting with you. I felt so supported just that there was another (laughs) education researcher that finds that this area is so important and needed and kind of neglected. We've kind of abdicated responsibility for researching these to like criminal justice folks and law enforcement folks. And those voices are certainly needed, but we need educators in there, too. So I'm glad to find somebody else thinks that that's important. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. And please keep us updated with your work. I'd be thank glad you. to share it out. So thank you again, okay. everybody. Anne Marie Cotman on the Safety Doc podcast. And a thank you to John Grant and the 405 Media out of Los Angeles, California, for syndicating the show. Check out safetyphd.com. Thank you so much. Thank you. This has been the Safety Doc Podcast with author, radio show host, and leading safety expert, Dr. David Perot.
Remember to check back each week for the latest, best, and most bizarre practices in safety preparation and crisis response. You can find Dr. Perodin on Twitter at SafetyPhD. And remember, the truth will keep you safe.